Andrew, you and I are here in Banff at the FQXI conference, uh, wanting to know what are the foundations of quantum physics, the observer, events, all of these very abstract, very sophisticated ideas. But you're an experimentalist. You get in the lab and you really measure things. You, you uh, have a, a detection. You keep things very cold so that atoms don't interfere with each other. And you see real stuff. It's not just equations on paper and people flailing their hands with all these big ideas. So I want to put you kind of uniquely here as an experimentalist. What can we learn from experiments in, in quantum mechanics that can help us understand not just how to make bank transactions safer or how to spy on people or make it impossible to do so, but rather what it means for the foundations of quantum theory? I have the highest respect for the <laughs> equations and the big ideas. They're integral to what we do. But uh, you're quite right that um, it is amazing what progress we're now being able to make with experimental tests of some of the things that uh, uh, for a long time were just concepts and questions. And uh, I suppose one of my heroes in this world is uh, Sir Anthony Leggett, Tony Leggett, whose first degree at Oxford was in classics. Mm. And then as a graduate student, he started to learn quantum theory. He got good enough at it to win a Nobel Prize <laughs> in it. But he never lost the rigor of his first degree in classical philosophy. And uh, he gave a lot of thought to this apparent mismatch that there is. He perceived it as a mismatch in the thinking of a lot of his colleagues between the very robust quantum theory of the very small, what he'd won his Nobel Prize for, and the very classical experience of life as we live it. And uh, rather than just sit around drinking coffee and arguing about it, he actually came up with some rigorous criteria. And in 1985, with a student of his, Anupam Garg, he came up with um, an inequality. So it was a mathematical inequality, and it would enable you to test the following interpretation of reality. He called it macro-realism, which was the conjunction of two beliefs. Uh, the first one is that a system at any given moment is in one and only one of its possible states. So let's take a two-state system. It's either here or there. And the uh, second uh, thing that goes with that is the concept that you could make a non-invasive measurement. That is that you could make an observation of which of those two states it's in which would not affect the subsequent history. And in fact, if you want to be really picky, would not affect the prior history uh -huh. either. And for a quarter of a century, although it sounds a simple concept, nobody could see how to do an experiment that would actually test it. In fact, some people say that's impossible, because you always have to interfere with the system if you make a measurement. Well, the, the, the way that he uh, illustrated it was like this, that. Um, Supposing I have my hand can be either there or there, and I have a flashlight here, or a laser, that I point. If, if it's up there and the light is scattered from my hand, then that might have disrupted it. Mm -hmm. But if there's no scattered light, then um, I can say, well, it didn't affect its subsequent mm -hmm. history at all. And in fact, he then came up with a test of how you would check whether that was the case. Because, of course, it could just be your flashlight was broken. <laughs> As experimentalists, you think about those things. Um, and, uh, but you're quite right. It's a very, very difficult experiment to do. And um, it happened that uh, in 2009, I was, uh, I was coming to the end of running a big national activity in the UK. And I took three weeks at the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. Uh, looking out to sea, sometimes metaphorically, sometimes literally, <laughs> actually, and uh, thought of a way that we might be able to implement this. Mm. And as it happened, other people around the same time, quite independently, were having ideas too. And uh, when I got back to Oxford, we, we, we turned that into a plan for an actual experiment. And we did the experiment, and we were able to uh, violate this inequality in the experiment that we did. So what that showed was that this very carefully defined interpretation of macro-realism 
could not be applied, at least to that particular experiment. Um, so we were very pleased with that result. Um, Tony Leggett's been kind enough to say that um, of all the different implementations, ours is the one that most closely mm -hmm. meets the requirements that he had in mind when he formulated it. And so this is an illustration of the way that one can take some of these concepts and at least rule some of them out, at least for the particular cases that you test in the lab. So, okay, it hasn't solved the whole problem, but it shows that we can make rigorous progress with experiments that we can actually do. Give me some more detail on that experiment, on, on how it ruled something out. What, what did it actually do? Um, the experiment was done on the um, nuclear spin of a phosphorus impurity in silicon. And the question was, could you say that the, the spin, which is like a little tiny magnet, in the nucleus of the, mo of, the, of the atom was either in a magnetic field, either pointing parallel to the magnetic field or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And the way we measured that was by using um, uh, 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 a, an electron spin in the vicinity as a kind of ancilla, a way of measuring it. And the way we did the non-invasive test was to do what a computer scientist would call a controlled knot gate, in other words, we applied a microwave pulse which would flip the spin of the electron if the nuclear spin was pointing one way yeah. and would not flip the spin of the yeah. electron if the nuclear spin was pointing the other way. And our claim was that if it didn't flip the spin of the electron, then it hadn't done anything. So in that oh. sense, it was a non-invasive measurement. And we had to be rather careful with the experiments because um, we're working in a in a finite world with a finite magnetic field at a finite temperature. And it turned out that if some of the nuclear spins were the wrong way up, it, that didn't matter, we could cope with that. But if some of the electron spins were the wrong way up to start with, then we would falsely deduce that we had not flipped them, when in fact they'd started the wrong way and we'd now flipped them back to the right way. And so we even went so far as to say, supposing by some unidentified law of physics, those ones were, were all conspiring to give the wrong answer, would we still have ruled out the macro-realism? Mm -hmm. So we took account of that. We, called, we, dis, we used a parameter called venality <laughs> to describe their liability to corruption. So now what did it rule out? It said you can't, of this system, simultaneously believe, A, that it's in either one state or the other at any given time, and you can tell which without interfering with it. Now, perhaps it's worth thinking how that differs from our everyday lives. Because in our everyday lives, although some questions that we ask having a co have a cost involved, you know, you want to get a bank statement, so somebody has to print out the bank statement, so there is a cost in getting the measurement. Nevertheless, we'd like to think that, that finding out how much money we've got in our bank account doesn't change the amount in the mm -hmm. bank account. So we'd like to think that that's a non-invasive observation mm -hmm. of what's in our bank. If we look it up online, and we th we'd like to think the bank doesn't change it because we've looked it up. And we'd like to think also that the amount of money we've got in our bank account at any given time is a certain amount. You know, it's not simultaneously naught and $5,000, yeah. you know, it, it is an amount. So we like to think that we're living our everyday lives in a way that things at a given time have a given state and that we can find out what that state is without changing it. And uh, of course you can think of counter examples in everyday life, but we like to think there are some examples of that. Um, what we showed in the experiment is that at least that particular system we were looking at, you could not hold the conjunction of those two beliefs about it. Mm. And in that sense, um, it was not a realist state in the sense that Tony Leggett was defining it. And I think that necessarily these things have to be very precise and very specific because we're trying to make rigorous statements, not just sort of wishy-washy um, discussion of it.